afternoon we had our Leadership Training for Christ program meet, and we've been studying through the book of 2 Samuel for that particular program, and so tonight I thought we would take a lesson from 2 Samuel chapter 24. So let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 24, and we're going to look at the story of David numbers the people. And talk about this a little bit. This is a very uh, interesting story. Let me just tell you this, that the purpose of this story being in the Bible is to explain how the temple came to be where it was eventually built. In fact, if you look in 1 Chronicles 21 and 22, you see that in chapter 21 we have this story, and in chapter 22... We have the uh, David assembling the materials for the building of the temple. And so how did the temple get to be built where it was built? What was the choice for the location and how did that come about? Well, this story in 2 Samuel 24 is the answer to that question. And that's the reason why this particular story is in the Bible. Now, of course, there's many other lessons that we can learn from this story as well. So we're going to go ahead and look at it and see what uh, happens here in this particular text. The, the chapter tells us about the sin of David in numbering the people. And the incident takes place close to the end of David's life. Some think that this may have occurred somewhere between... Uh, four to six years before uh, the end of David's life. And so uh, scholars are divided exactly as to what it was that David's sin consisted of and because uh, it seems like numbering the people in and of itself doesn't seem to be uh, anything wrong with that. Most scholars say that the sin wasn't specifically in uh, numbering the people per se, that is just in getting a count, but it was because of David's motives or his, his attitude about it. And so um, when we look at this particular uh, chapter, uh, we're going to think about some of the things that the chapter has to say. First of all, let's look at the text and let's look at uh, some different things that happen here in this text. In verses 1 through 4, we read about David's command. Uh, again, it says, The anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him, Now go throughout all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and count the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there are, and may the eyes of my Lord the King see it. But why does my Lord the King desire this thing? Nevertheless, the King's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the King to count the people of Israel. The Bible says here that God's anger was aroused to move David to number the people, verse 1 tells us. And what was it that David was thinking or doing uh, to arouse God's anger? Uh, we don't exactly know. The text doesn't really explain everything in detail to us, uh, except that uh, it was something, numbering the people here was something that was against God's will, um, for whatever reason David was doing it, and it demonstrated a lack of faith and trust in God. Now, one of the questions that many people ask about this verse is that, well, if, if God uh, aroused David to, um, if he moved David to a number of people, why was David held responsible for this? And one of the thoughts that has been suggested is that uh, it was David's heart that was wrong to begin with, and God just led him to the ultimate consequences of where his heart was at. You know, when David lusted against Bathsheba back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and then he committed adultery 
Um, it took several months before David realized, uh, and being confronted with Nathan, that he had committed grievous sin against God. Well, here, David's heart evidently is not right in this uh, situation, and it is uh, leads to his numbering the people. And that is the thing that is the ultimate fruition of David's heart. And so if the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and he moved David to number them is an explanation then of David's heart and the consequences that are associated with that. One of the things that we need to understand about the Lord is that He wants us to fully appreciate the consequences of our own choices, you know. And sometimes the Lord will allow us then to get into situations and circumstances that uh, can cause us a considerable amount of grief and pain and even lead to our committing sin of some kind so that God, so that we then will know the full consequences of our thoughts, of our actions, of the things that we seek to do. And that may very well have been what uh, is going on here in this particular context. And so David committed, well, whatever the sin was, David knew that he had sinned. Because if you fast forward a little bit to verse 10, it says specifically that David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David knew what his, his sin was, and he didn't contest it. He didn't try to say that he didn't sin. He freely confessed it. And so this wasn't a question in David's mind. It was something that David understood that he had done wrong. Um, although we're not privy to the exact details of what that was. And so uh, David committed a sin in numbering the people uh, in this particular chapter. Well, he tells Joab to number all the tribes. And then Joab goes and he asks his uh, commanders and captains to go with him to number the tribes, to go throughout all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, from the north to the south, and number the people. Well, Joab initially protested against it and said, Now, why do you want to do this? You know, Joab understood that something was off here uh, as to why David wanted to number the people that this wasn't uh, normal for him. And so he said, look, uh, we really don't need to do this. Uh, uh, the Lord give you more, a hundred times more than there are. And the Lord will provide for this if that's something you're concerned about. But Joab's uh, counsel here didn't prevail, and, and the king's word did, verse 4 says, and so he sent them out to account the people. Well, in verses 5 through 9, we see... Joab's work in numbering the people. It says they crossed over the Jordan and camped in error on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim Hachi. They came to Dan Jan and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the highlights and the Canaanites. Then they went out to South Judah as far as Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. So it's another long period of time that it took to number uh, people here. And then Joab gives the sum of the number here in verse 9. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king, and there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. And so there's the uh, result of the count. So Joab's work is found in verses 5 through 9. And it's important to note here that David's command was a national command. He involved more than just himself in his sin. And we'll see this 
become an important point later on in the chapter. All right, verses 10 through 14, we find David's condemnation. And again, we know it says, David's heart condemned him, verse 10 says, after he had known the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now when, so uh, look at verses 11 to 14. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I'll offer you three things, choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said, Yeah, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So David's heart condemned him, the text says. He asked for forgiveness, and Gad sent, uh, or God sent the prophet Gad to inform uh, David of God's punishment. And so he gave David a choice. You can have seven years of famine, or three months of fleeing before your enemies, or three days of plague. And David chose to follow the hand of the Lord, which means he didn't really make a choice. He let the Lord decide. And verse 15 says that the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of people died. So that's what happens next in verses 15 through 17. And let's just read 16 and 17. When the angel stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, It is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned, and I have done wickedness. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Well, there's several things to say about this. First of all, um, we note that this was a national sin. David involved Joab, the captain, and all the people in this sin. And because everyone was involved in the sin, the punishment had to involve everyone as well. I mean, think about uh, what it means to have a national sin. Uh, that's something that we don't really uh, have to face today from the standpoint of our relationship with God because the church is God's nation on earth today. And the church is held in uh, perpetual forgiveness uh, through the blood of Christ, as we're going to see a little bit later on. But in that day and time, before Christ had died on the cross, a national sin merited a national uh, punishment for the sin. And so that's why there is this uh, punishment that's coming upon this land at this time. And so the punishment then was that uh, God chose the plague and 70,000 people died. Evidently, this plague was delivered by one of God's angels personally. And he could be seen physically because David saw him standing on the threshing floor of Aruna. So this was a very visible kind of a miraculous punishment that was being uh, levied upon Israel. And when David saw him there, then he uh, prayed to the Lord and Confess the sin again, verse 17. Well, in uh, verses 18 to 25, we see David's uh, payment and prayers then. It says, And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aruna went out, bowed before the king with his 
face to the ground. Then Arun said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, Buy the threshing floor from you to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arun said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, there are oxen for burnt sacrifices and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Alright, so as a result of this, um, God commands David to build this altar on the threshing floor of Arunah. The threshing floor is a place where wheat is and grain is winnowed. It's tossed up into the air and then the wind blows the chaff away and the grain uh, falls back down to the ground. And this is a place where um, it's windy. Usually they were on hills, places where the wind could blow and, and uh, do the threshing. And so that's what this place was. And so uh, <coughs> that's where the plague stopped. That's where the angels stopped. And so God told David, you go up there, you put the plague stop, and you make an altar. And then you offer sacrifices on that altar. Well, Aruna offered to give David the, the land, the threshing floor, the sacrifices, anything that he wanted. Just go ahead and, and you have it, you take it, you give it. But David said, no, I will surely buy it from you for a price. And then he makes this very significant statement. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which cost me nothing. And what a tremendous example David is there in uh, teaching us that true sacrifice must cost us something in order for it to be a sacrifice. And uh, David then built that altar and he offered sacrifices and God, as the text says, heard his prayers. Well, let's go back and think about some of the teachings that we find in this particular chapter as we've looked at the text now. First of all, as we mentioned earlier, David's sin was on a national level. He involved Joab, verse 2. He involved the armies, verse 4. He involved the people, verses 5 and 7. And he involved the land, verse 8. And God's response then to David's sin was on a national level as well. All the proposed punishments that God gave to David would take a would exact a penalty on a national level. And, and, you know, to us this sounds kind of strange that God would just punish David alone, uh, but that he would punish the whole nation. But if you think about it, it's not an unreasonable thing because we uh, today in our country punish those who are accomplices to crimes. So, for example, if a person is a... Uh, driving a getaway car in a bank robbery, for example, uh, he is held just as guilty as the bank robbers are. Why is that? Because he was an accessory to the crime. Many years ago, uh, my mother-in-law sat on a jury and they were trying a lady for murder. Uh, but she didn't commit the murder herself directly but she was an accessory to murder. And an accessory is tried for murder just as the person who commits the murder. Well, what we have here is David as a, a sinner and committing a sin against God, and then he involves others in this sin. So they become accessories to David's sin. And so uh, God punishes the nation, not just David, for this particular sin. David's choice was to fall into God's hands. And God then uh, had a plague come upon the people. We don't know the nature of that, but 70,000
thousand people uh, died as a result of it, and that was part of this punishment for this for this sin. David knew that he had committed sin, as we mentioned in verse ten. What was the sin? There have been several suggestions made. Some have suggested that David was planning a world conquest, that he had uh, decided that he was going to uh, go out and, and become a, a world conqueror. And, you know, like many of the nations did, and the kings of the nations did, and that day and time when they got everything under control in their own home, then they went out and started conquering other nations. We don't know that that was what David was thinking or not, but some have suggested that. And that would certainly be a path that God did not have in mind, and that that's what, why David was numbering the people so he could go on a world conquest. Some have suggested self-exaltation. That is, that David was numbering the people at the, you know, toward the end of his life, toward the end of his uh, reign, so that he could sit back and say, oh, look at all these things that I have done, you know kind of self-exaltation. And we know that in other passages of the Bible that those who boast in such a way are, are held to be responsible for that false boast against God. Nebuchadnezzar was one of them in the book of Daniel. And uh, God humbled him and took him down because of that sin of self-exaltation. Others have suggested pride or even boasting of some sort we don't know exactly what the internal sin of David was, but David knew what it was, and he confessed it. And he doesn't dispute that he had sinned. The bottom line, I think, is that this was a display of lack of faith in God. But it was on a national level. And that is certainly something that is going to have consequences for the nation. Displaying lack of faith in God and uh, denying uh, God's sovereignty would be a tremendous sin and that would then have consequences for God's people. And God needed to make sure that it was known that David's sin was atoned for correctly. Contrast David's attitude here with Jonathan's attitude in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. And there it says, Then Jonathan said to the young men who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. That wasn't David's attitude. David's attitude evidently was, we need as many as possible. And so he was counting to see how many he had. But Jonathan's attitude was, nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. In other words, the Lord can save whether it's a whole bunch of people or whether it's just a few people. And David evidently had forgotten that, at least in part. Another thing that we think about and we thought about in this lesson is that God's nation today is the church. You say, well, why doesn't God exact the same kind of punishments today as He did back then? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but the main reason is this, that God's nation is no longer the nation of Israel anymore, the physical nation of Israel, Today, God's nation is the church. And the Bible says that the church is kept pure by the blood of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27 says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And the king of this nation today is Jesus Christ himself, who is reigning at the right hand of the throne of God. And there is no sin in him. And so there's not going to be any national punishment on the church today from the standpoint of the same thing that's happened 
in the Old Testament. And so there's no longer going to be anything like this that takes place. Now, the Bible also teaches that Jesus rules the nations with a rod of iron, according to Revelation 19 and verse 15. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And that, of course, is an image of the Word of God, that today Jesus rules over the world through His Word. His Word is a sharp two-edged sword, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. And that goes out of His mouth, and that's what God uses to strike the nations and to rule over the nations today. And so, uh, there wouldn't be a similar circumstance today uh, for some kind of national sin that's taking place. Now, God would certainly allow a nation to be destroyed uh, if that was within His will, if that nation no longer practiced righteousness and, and decided to go after wickedness, then that would certainly be a consequence uh, of that. And it wouldn't be a miraculous destruction like it was in this particular chapter, but it would be the natural course of events. Well, the final lesson that I'd like to draw from this chapter is this, that David did not offer sacrifice for nothing. Um, and we have to ask ourselves a question, you know, what do our sacrifices cost us? Who are we more like when we give today? Are we going to give with the same heart and spirit that David gave that, you know, he's not going to offer something to the Lord that costs him nothing? Are we more like the widow who gave out of her poverty her last two mites, as Jesus discusses in Mark 14 and verses 42 through 44? Or are we more like the Pharisees in that story who gave out of their abundance? And the giving that we do today is not a sacrifice for us. Are we giving with the right attitude and with the right spirit? We need to think about David's attitude here in this chapter regarding his giving. And that is certainly a tremendous example for us today. I will not give to the Lord something which costs me nothing. So many today, I believe, may think that their giving is perfectly fine when the fact of the matter is, is that they're giving out of their abundance and not making a real sacrifice. A real sacrifice is what God wants. And we need to look into our own hearts and ask ourselves whether or not we are making that real sacrifice sacrifice, whether we are giving something to God that costs us something. And if the answer is we're not, then we need to reevaluate the sacrifices that we're making for God, whether it's monetary or whether it's sacrifices of time or sacrifices of talent, whatever that might be, we need to be thinking about those things. David's example is a great one here at the end of the chapter. So what can we take from this story? Well, one, one thing is that God takes sin very seriously. And He took David's sin very seriously here. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Number two, confession of sin is the best way to deal with the problem of sin. David confessed his sin there was consequences to his sin, yes, but he did confess it and he acknowledged it. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number three, there are consequences to sin that we must face. And while there may not be you know, miraculous consequences, as there were here in this particular chapter, there are certainly uh, physical consequences that result the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap destruction, and he that soweth of the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So there are consequences to that which we sow. If we sow to the flesh, then we're going to have to face the consequences of sowing to the flesh. Lesson number four is that God had an eternal purpose. When we look at this chapter, the point of the story is to tell us how the temple came to be where it was. And the temple was part of God's great plan. Going back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promised to David that he would make him a house and that he would uh, have a son, that the son would build the temple. And then that promise finds its ultimate fulfillment in God's son, Jesus. And its ultimate fulfillment in God's house, the church. And that is God's eternal purpose, according to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11. God needed to, or God wanted to uh, advance this eternal purpose, and He uses this opportunity to do just that. And then finally, let's be thankful for Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. He has nailed the old covenant to the cross. And no longer must we then pay the penalty for our own sins as was done back in the Old Testament. But now the penalty for our sins is paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank God tonight that we don't sit here expecting divine punishment to come from God for the sins that we commit on a daily basis uh, because Jesus has done His work and we should be very grateful for that because now we are in a covenant of grace as opposed to a covenant of law which David was under in his particular day and time. And because that covenant of law has been nailed to the cross, today we have the opportunity to live for Jesus each and every day, to have our sins forgiven as we ask Him for forgiveness, and to not have to uh, pay these uh, divine penalties for sin that had to be paid in the Old Testament uh, when those sins took place in order for God to be a just God. God has satisfied justice through His Son Jesus. And today then, if we will hear His Word and believe it, repent of our sins, confess Him as Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, God will say, I will count the justice done to Jesus in place of justice that will be, should be done for you for your sins. And what a great blessing that is. And so why not take advantage of God's a gracious offer this evening to become His child. If you need the prayers of the church to uh, deal with some sin within your life that you need help with, then we're ready to help you with that. And you can come right now and make that request known while together we stand and while we sing.
thank the Lord's Supper and have it in the left prayer. Not seeing it.